Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's uh, AFMS uh, seminar. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, today's speaker, Professor Filippo Coletti, uh, who is a professor of experimental fluid dynamics at ETH Zurich, uh, where he has been since 2020. Uh, before that, he was a McKnight Land Grant Associate Professor of Aerospace Engineering Mechanics at the University of Minnesota. Uh, and prior to that, he performed his doctoral studies at the Von Kármán Institute of Fluid Dynamics and at the University of Stuttgart, where he obtained his PhD in 2010. Uh, he received the NSF Career Award in 2015 and the ERC Consol Consolidated Grant in 2022. And his research interests focus on particle-laden flows, uh, some of which is going to talk about today, uh, in which he studies a range of experimental approaches and with applications to environmental, biomedical, and industry problems. And today he's going to talk about particle transport on the free surface of turbulent water. Over to you, Philip. Uh, thank you, Vishal, for the invitation. And uh, thanks, everybody, for, uh, for attending this, this presentation. It's a, it's a pleasure. I, I know the Australasian seminar a little bit. I, um, I've seen multiple uh, uh, great speakers giving this uh, type of online seminar before in previous months and years. So it's, it's truly a pleasure. Um, an interesting time of the day for me. This is, uh, you know, 8 a.m. I'm hoping that my kids uh, who are just about to leave the apartments to go to school, they will not cross this part of the house on their way to school. But if they do, uh, please forgive me. Um, all right, we're going to get this started. Um, as Michelle mentioned, this is a uh, work uh, uh, focusing on uh, how particles are transported on on uh, on free surface flows free surface uh, basically uh, above uh, turbulent water um, this is uh, uh, work that we have been carrying out in the last i would say two years maybe two plus years it's something that i i started to get interested in already when i was in minnesota but it was really since i moved to, to eth a couple of years ago um, that, that this has become really a, a focus for, for my group. Um, the work I'm going to present is uh, uh, the result of um, very hard work and uh, I think very, very brilliant work from a uh, postdoc from Maisa uh, Saini Yeshevli and a PhD student Harry Sana Salmon and uh, senior scientist Katya Chang. They're all in my, in my group at ETH. And it's, uh, it's also the result of collaboration with my friend uh, Claudio Mucciniak, who's a senior scientist at the Swiss National Lab in, in uh, here close to, close to Zurich in Dubai. Right, so I'm going to start with uh, what you see here on the right. It is a, a, a beautiful cover from National Geographic, um, which uh, already in 2018 was titling uh, Planets or Plastic. Um, because clearly you cannot have both when you're dumping uh, eight or so uh, million tons of plastic in the ocean every year. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. That's what the, 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 the cover of National Geographic was saying. And the tip of the iceberg analogy works very well. First of all, it's, it's, uh, I think it's interesting how they the photograph here uh, depicts this, this plastic bag uh, looking very much like an iceberg if you don't pay attention. Um, but the point is, uh, I guess one of the points uh, from the mechanics standpoint for sure, is that uh, plastics does float, at least a large amount of plastic uh, does float. We're talking about uh, more or less half of the plastic produced in the world that is less dense than water. So, of course, it's going to float. Um, and if it floats, it will collect in, uh, on, on, on the surface. And, uh, in fact, the evidence is that it, it, it does uh, agglomerate into very large patches. The biggest one, the most famous one, is the so-called Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Uh, you probably all know about this. Sometimes when I... And I give this, this talk to, to, to people, I see people being very much surprised. Uh, they, they didn't know about this, but uh, I think it's by now it's super famous. It's basically a continent. Okay? It stretches um, uh, over the Pacific Ocean uh, between Hawaii and, and, and California, I would say. Uh, this is a trip I did uh, by airplane uh, when I was living in California. I did my honeymoon in Hawaii. And I didn't know back then I was... Uh, uh, flying over a, a gigantic garbage patch. Back then, actually, it was less uh, concentrated today in terms of uh, amount of plastic. Um, uh, just some numbers here. That at least this is, was true, I think, three years ago when uh, this, uh, this uh, uh, little, or two years ago when this little GIF animation was uh, proposed by theoceancleanup.com. The surface covered by this gigantic patch of, of uh, 
uh, uh, plastic litter floating in the ocean, has the size of three times France, okay, that is insanity to you, 1.6 million uh, kilometers square. And the, the number of pieces that are floating there is, is, is generous. Uh, 1.8 trillion pieces of plastics, it was estimated. I can't even wrap my, my head around it. So uh, think about 25, 150, sorry, pieces of plastics for each human being on the planet. That gives you uh, maybe a better idea. And uh, make no mistake, this thing is filthy. This thing is disgusting. It's the worst soup you'll, you'll ever try. Right? It's, uh, um, it's not, of course, a solid continent. Uh, it's not, uh, a, 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 let's say, a compacted um, agglomerate of, of uh, floating plastic, but it is, uh, at uh, certain locations, very, very dense. Now, of course, this is a huge environmental problem. Um, but I'm going to take a very much fundamental food mechanics approach uh, to at least some of the issues that have to do with this problem. I guess the, the first question that uh, for me uh, uh, seems uh, even obvious, but obviously very, very important is how fast do floating plastics spread slash aggregate? They clearly are spread around by turbulent water, but they also aggregate, as you can, you can tell from the fact that they are uh, collecting into gigantic patches. Um, but to me, that begs, a, begs an even more fundamental question, which is uh, how does free surface turbulent behave in, in the first place? Do we even know that? In fact, the, the, the question of free surface turbulence has been posed uh, um, many times be, before. Um, you can think of the problem as a, as a relatively uh, simple one, or at least a very relatively uh, easy to rationalize. Think about homogeneous isotropic turbulence uh, in the water, say in the bulk of the water, just the distance from the free surface. Now, now on top of this, uh, this uh, homogeneous uh, isotropic turbulence, you have uh, a flat lid. Basically, you have a free surface boundary condition. And if the turbulence is not very, very violent and you don't have uh, weak, strong winds, the, the, the waviness of the free surface could be neglected. So you really have just a flat lid with no penetration and no shear. Um, now, what people have looked at in the past uh, quite a bit is how the free surface modifies the turbulence uh, underneath. And this is something that, um, in fact, has been researched since the 70s. Uh, and there are similar contributions that comes to, to um, of course, that continue to be uh, explored as a question. And I'm showing here a schematic from a beautiful paper of Jacques Magnodet, who in 2003 was summarizing a bit of the state of the art um, in terms of the, the, how this, this boundary condition of uh, no shear, no penetration, uh, modifies the, the turbulence both in, in, uh, in, in, a, in a bulk region, so basically a, at least an integral turbulent integral scale below the surface, and then in a viscous sublayer close to the surface. But I'm actually interested in the opposite side of the, the problem. I, I'm interested in how the free surface under the, the, the excuse me, how the, the turbulence under the free surface modifies the motion on the free surface. Um, if I just think of uh, the, the, the material free surface, which, which covers the, 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 the bulk of turbulence, and I look at uh, how things are transported. And for example, a, a fluid parcel on the free surface is transported there. I have a turbulent velocity field. But how is this uh, turbulent velocity behaving? It does it behave like 2D turbulence because this is, after all, a, a, a surface, so a 2D set? Or does it behave like the 3 turbulence underneath? Uh, can I define an en energy cascade on this free surface? And uh, would that be a direct or inverse energy cascade? Uh, what about the dispersion of the free surface? Would it follow, for example, uh, per dispersion uh, patterns that we, we, we know or think we know in 3D turbulence? Um, and what about the concentration of uh, tracers or other non-tracer uh, particles on, on the free surface? Uh, we, we looked at, uh, or you know, we are seeing this, this uh, agglomeration of particles. Uh, what's the rationale behind that? And finally, in nature, in the environment, we have particles of many sizes and many shapes. Uh, how's the size of the particles uh, affecting the, the, the transport? And in fact, there are very many, excuse me, very few uh, contributions in a relative sense that are focused on this. Uh, some work from, uh, from uh, Professor Banerjee in the 90s and 2000s, 
um, a couple of papers coming from our fellow Sudakis group, a very interesting contribution, but I guess scattered uh, in a relatively speaking compared to, to other topics that have been, uh, been looked at in very much detailed concern associated with the same, with the same physics. So I became interested in this problem, as I mentioned already back in Minnesota, and then uh, coming to, to ETH Zurich, I decided to, to take up uh, what I felt were very fundamental questions uh, using experimental techniques. I'm an experimentalist, uh, as, uh, as Vishal mentioned. Uh, we uh, therefore started uh, multiple measurement campaigns using uh, uh, an open channel flow facility, a relatively large channel that I'll describe in a minute. Uh, but we also used a, a zero mean flow uh, homogeneous turbulence uh, chamber, um, which uh, was built last year here at BTH. Um, and then I'll also show some results that we um, um, obtained when I was in Minnesota using an outdoor uh, stream facility, um, essentially a field study, although with a, a basically a laboratory study approach uh, that I'll discuss. I have to say that for all the um, results, all the results I show today, I will show today, um, they are uh, taken, they are obtained in uh, regimes in which the, 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 the waviness of the free surface is, is very marginal. Uh, essentially, we have waves which are the millimeter scale, so the energy associated to them is essentially negligible with respect to the turbulent kinetic energy uh, under the free surface and uh, characterizing the, the motion on the free surface. Um, and so the, the transport uh, will, will not be uh, majorly affected by waves. Uh, of course, this, this will become something uh, interesting in many configurations that they're simply not, uh, not um, looking at today, at least. All right, so let me now start from the uh, um, first measurement that we carried out in this uh, open channel flow. And here we essentially looked at the grid turbulence, um, meaning that we took our channel. This has a, a, a test section of six meters in length, about one meter in width, and uh, we filled it with about six centimeters of water depth. Um, the velocity uh, for the measurements I'm going to show has a the mean velocity of 0.3 meter a second. This is you know, very characteristic of uh, streaming uh, streaming flow, but in general, it's just a, a, um, a velocity that for us sets a, a grid turbulence uh, behavior because we insert a grid, um, passive uh, grid, a classic uh, um, square grid with a mesh spacing uh, M of about eight centimeters. The Reynolds number is enough to ensure a turbulence with a relatively small uh, um, turbulence intensity uh, far downstream. And the fluid number here is small, and therefore we, we don't anticipate any fact that we, we verify that we have a minimal, I would say completely negligible, free, at least, uh, let's say, uh, hardly measurable uh, deformation of the free surface. Okay, so the waves, as I just mentioned, are, are some millimeter. In this flow, we release uh, 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 polyethylene sphere, polyethylene spheres, uh, about one millimeter in size. Um, they are slightly positively buoyant, and uh, therefore they stay on the free surface. Um, those we will treat as floating tracers. So they're not perfect tracers uh, because they, they float, so they don't get um, uh, entrained below the surface. Uh, the, the surface tension and the positive buoyancy, the slight positive buoyancy, uh, keep them on the free surface. However, they are uh, small enough to essentially capture uh, most of the energy, if not all of the energy of the, of the turbulence. Um, I will not go into details, but basically we tested one millimeter, even two millimeters, then we tested 80 microns, and essentially the behavior uh, of, of various floating particles was, uh, was immeasurably different, even for higher order statistics. So we, we believe they are, that they, they, we can think of them as, as, as good tracers if they are uh, far apart from each other, and we'll get into that later on. Um, in terms of measurement techniques, uh, we do classic particle image velocimetry um, in the subsurface, as I'm showing here with the PRE. Um, this is just a, an illustration showing that we, we uh, illuminate from the bottom, and we basically look at uh, flow statistics uh, in a streamwise uh, free surface normal so vertical plane. But mostly we focus on the free surface, as I mentioned. So we have uh, two PID cameras 
um, uh, one next to the other, and they span about one meter uh, in a streamwise direction. And so they allow us to uh, collect uh, um, extensive statistics uh, on the free, free surface motion, uh, looking at these, uh, these tracers through particle tracking velocity. All right, so let me start from the most basic and maybe even obvious uh, um, things, which uh, are is the turbulence in the in the bulk approaching the free surface. So this is PAV along a vertical plane, um, uh, far downstream uh, where turbulence is, is, is in equilibrium, and we have uh, here z my uh, downward uh, vertical coordinate being zero at the free surface. And I'm just plotting um, axis streamwise. I'm just plotting uh, uh, contours of the streamwise and vertical uh, root mean square fluctuations of the velocity. And uh, really, all that I, I want to see here, show here, is that the, the, as we should expect, the, the, the vertical RMS fluctuations uh, are uh, shrinking to very small values as I approach the pre surface. And that's what we expect. In fact, technically, if the free surface was absolutely flat and I could approach the free surface uh, exactly, so really get to the free surface, my vertical RMS should go to virtually to be zero. Um, it doesn't go to zero because the free surface does move slightly. Um, but, but again, the, the idea is simply that we see what we expect, which means that the uh, no penetration boundary condition is. Uh, Producing a, a reduction of the free surface of the vertical RMS uh, as I approach the, the, the free surface. Nothing, nothing surprising. I'm more interested in the uh, length scales uh, of the flow and, and uh, the dissipation rate because this will become interesting uh, as I move on to the free surface data. So uh, the integral scale that I can uh, get with a simple two point correlation of this Eulerian flow field, it tells me that I have an integral scale of order 10 centimeters is shrinking a bit as I as I reach the surface, that's also expected. Um, and it is of the order of my mesh uh, grade size, of course, because that's the integral scale I'm injecting in the uh, energetic scale I'm injecting in the flow with this, with this grade. Um, my dissipation rate, uh, which I can get both by structural functions, um, Assuming the model of scaling or by directly differentiating my velocity field, it gives me essentially the, the, the same result. And this is, is not a surprising result. The, the, the dissipation rate has an order of magnitude very close to uh, the, the, the scale, the classic scaling I, I, I'm expecting, a cube of the URMS fluctuation divided by the interest. All right, so this is just to say uh, you know, the, the, what are the, the length scales and the, what's the dissipation rate in the uh, in the free surface, it might vary a bit as I approach the free surface, which is expected, but I have a clear, clear scales and clear uh, scaling of the dissipation. Now, everything else here is going to be focused on what happens on the free surface. So, on the free surface, I have uh, essentially PTV data. Um, I have uh, trajectories, uh, even fairly long trajectories, as I'll discuss, but let me just start with uh, simple, simple point statistics. This is a uh, me showing a PDF of the velocity fluctuations, uh, streamwise in uh, in blue and uh, lateral spanwise in, in orange, and uh, you can see that essentially they, they look the proportion uh, that is a slight skewness, uh, which uh, in fact uh, depends by the fact that I have a fairly extended streamwise um, region, uh, so I have I'm affected a little bit by the decay here, but overall uh, the the closeness to Gaussianity is, is, uh, is pretty good. Um, that's not a surprise, and they give me the, a, a, an RMS uh, velocity fluctuation, which is consistent with the subsurface PAV level I have. The accelerations, um, they're very intermittent. And this is already first interesting uh, um, uh, observation. If this was something like uh, to the turbulence, which has been uh, postulated or at least proposed, uh, uh, then I would not expect uh, such a high level of intermittency for the acceleration. I should expect uh, a more or less Gaussian behavior of the uh, of the acceleration on the on, of the traces of the free surface, which in fact uh, see uh, have a high kurtosis, have a kurtosis of about eleven. This would be characteristic of a large uh, of an intensely turbulent uh, turbulent flow. And as you can see, the level of, of uh, isotropy is fairly good. I, I really can't tell big difference between the streamwise and the lateral. All right. Now, it's going to be more interesting to look at how uh, the, the, the integral scales and the dissipation rate look on this free surface. Um, 
So in terms of the integral scale, I am looking at velocity of the relations here. I have a very homogeneous flow, so it's not difficult for me to, to calculate a good, uh, let's say, uh, well converged and, and, uh, and extensive uh, velocity of the relation. Uh, and, and you see that the, 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 this is the streamwise, but be the same for the lateral velocity of the relation. It decays um, up to almost zero, and I can uh, easily fit uh, an exponential and uh, find uh, an integral scale over which my, my uh, turbulent velocity field is, is, is expressed. And that is of the order of per centimeter is close to the integral scale that I, that I would expect from uh, simply the, the fact that I'm injecting energy for eight centimeters. All right, now with that, uh, I will get uh, my estimate of, of URMS uh, cube over L, uh, where integral scale is again at the order of 10 to the minus four meters per second cube. So this is an estimate that is, is coming back and is close to the one on this surface. Um, if I now look at how the energy on the free surface is decaying, because this is pretty turbulent, so I can see uh, this uh, the, the, the free surface uh, fluctuating energy decaying in a streamwise direction, I actually see a, a, a decay um, of this energy Q square, um, which really uh, matches what I would expect from uh, uh, classic results in, in, in the bulk of the turbulence, decay turbulence with an exponential, uh, with an exponent and uh, about one, minus 1 1.2. So this fluctuates a bit in the literature, but I guess this is very much consistent with what I expect to happen in the, and I can see in fact it happens even in the, in the bulk. So this is a hint that the free surface uh, is is behaving like the, the to the excuse me like the the, the bulk turbulence underneath, and let me just keep building this this evidence, um, and you know you can judge yourself if this would be an obvious result or not, but we will have something to say about that later. Um, so let's make one more step. Uh, if I have to point uh, correlations, I can get. Uh, uh, a structure function from, from the same data, of course, it's just recasting a little bit different. And then I can see that my uh, second order velocity structure function, in fact, um, shows a clear uh, uh, two third scaling with the separation, just as my chromatograph theory uh, would predict uh, for, uh, say, two dimensional incompressible turbulence. Um, if I even uh, choose my constant C2 as a 2.1, just like. Uh, uh, data indicates for, again, three-dimensional compressible turbulence, then I can get an estimate from my uh, dissipation rate just by uh, essentially uh, compensating the second order structure function. And, and the, the plateau uh, that I get there, it really is very close to this uh, 10 to the minus four uh, meters per second cube that uh, I can estimate in multiple other ways. And this consistent, again, with the subsurface dissipation. All right. Um, but of course, I'm taking all of this from uh, uh, PTV, from uh, Lagrangian particle tracking. So um, I can also look at Lagrangian statistics. I can look at my uh, trajectories, which are relatively long. As you can imagine, I'm tracking uh, uh, traces on the free surface. So they don't disappear from my field of view very easily. Uh, so I can look at my uh, uh, Lagrangian velocity of the correlation and function of time, of time delay. And that decays nicely in a quasi exponential way. And my uh, e fold uh, um, decay gives me an integral scale which is nicely around about uh, one second. And that uh, is, is, uh, is very close to what I would get from a simple scaling of the integral scale divided by the URMS fluctuation. So, no, no surprise there. And, uh, and so uh, I, can, uh, I can go even farther, in fact, with my, with my uh, Lagrangian statistics since we get, uh, we, we, we can uh, uh, use uh, high speed cameras and get a uh, good temporal resolution. I can actually uh, measure the acceleration of my traces. And from the acceleration of the traces, I get a, 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 an autocorrelation of the acceleration, which would decay uh, over a time scale, which is meant to be my, or supposed to be, in classic turbulence, my model of uh, scale. Well, if I do that, I get a model of scale about 0.1 uh, seconds. And if I uh, rework uh, what the uh, dissipation rate should be, given the climatic viscosity, Back I am to my 10 to the minus four dissipation. So everything is, is, is lining up, except this is pre-surface turbulence, I'm not in the bottom, all right? Um, one thing that is, uh, is not convenient in a, in a free surf, excuse me, in an in a open channel flow is that uh, there is an advective uh, velocity. And so my trajectories are, are long, meaning that they don't, the traces don't disappear from my field of view for no reason. 
but they do get out of the field of view in, uh, in, in about one second because that's the time they take to, to move uh, a couple of seconds. That's the time they take to go uh, in front of the camera and, and just uh, move out. So a zero mean flow facility is very much more convenient in this sense. Um, and this is what we built at uh, ETH uh, um, again just uh, last year. Um, this is inspired by uh, uh, other uh, zero mean flow facilities in which have uh, random activation of jets. Evan Mariano was the first one to propose this design uh, in water several years ago when he was at Cornell, and then he created a similar one in Berkeley. Um, I have uh, I did build one in air. Uh, in Minnesota, which we are rebuilding here at ETH. This one is also in water, of course, and it has uh, about uh, exactly, sorry, 128 jets, so two panels of 64 jets each. Uh, these jets are, are created uh, by, by pumps, which are actuated randomly in a, in a random sequence because they're attached to a PLC elements, so I can control them uh, individually. I can switch them on and off independently. Um, and so they generate a, a large homogeneous uh, turbulence region over scales much larger than integral scales. Uh, this is very important uh, because if uh, the region of homogeneity was not so large, uh, that, that would indicate that the, the, the boundary conditions essentially are perturbing the, the, the flow. There could be a mean shear affecting the flow. This is typically what happens in a, in a concurrent flow in a, in a double impeller, say a French washing machine type of facility or other or other Taylor Quack facilities to generate intense turbulence. In this case, I do have a nice and homogeneous turbulent region um, uh, with the negligible mean flow. And, uh, and uh, so this is, in fact, a good way for me to reproduce my grid turbulence without the mean flow. And the good, good thing is also that the turbulence intensity, well, I would say the, the uh, Reynolds number can be much larger. You see the integral scales are 10 centimeters, so it's similar to my grid turbulence, but the RMS fluctuation is significantly larger. So, in fact, uh, Reynolds lambda, I'm not listing it here, but it will be about uh, 600. Um, and so uh, I'm just maybe showing quickly the um, uh, this animation to to, uh, to show how the velocity field is the thing it looks like. Um, so we have uh, access to, in this case, I would say, down to the Kolmogorov scale, to maybe a couple of Kolmogorov scales, which would be a couple of millimeter, oh, I'm sorry, uh, a couple of hundred microns, so 0 0.2, 0 0.2 millimeters here, up to my 10 centimeter integral scale. All right, so from all of this, I'm not interested in the bulk to, so much. This for this talk, I'm just looking at the free surface. The advantage is that uh, the zero mean flow allows me to track my uh, trajectories for a very long time. And so getting very uh, well converged and very uh, extended uh, Lagrangian statistics. If I then look at my mean square displacement, for example, you see that here on the uh, left, I have my mean square displacement as a function of uh, the time lag um, obtained from the channel. Uh, from the open channel flow, and basically I can only see the ballistic regime because I'm only extend, I can only extend my trajectories to about one integral time scale. If instead I uh, use my, my zero mean flow facilities, I have access to 10 times longer trajectories essentially. And then uh, you can see the, the, the clear transition from the, the ballistic regime to the diffusive regime. So a, a slope of tau to the one, let's say, instead of tau speed. This is useful not only because it allows me to really uh, check that the, the, the behavior is what I expect in terms of uh, Taylor diffusion, but really because it allows me to uh, look at higher order statistics for the Lagrangian, um, uh, Lagrangian trajectories. For example, that allows me to use the uh, relation that uh, I found in Mani Yagla, but I guess it's, it's, even, it's even older, uh, the one that basically uh, tells us that we can use the cross product between the acceleration uh, um, uh, difference and the velocity difference uh, over distances uh, in the inertial range. And that uh, sample average is supposed to give us uh, uh, essentially it's supposed to be negative for direct test case. It's supposed to, to be give us, giving us a minus two times epsilon, while well, epsilon is my dissipation rate in 3D compressible turbulence. So this is a result of obtained for two-dimensional compressible turbulence. Um, if I see this result verified, I have to conclude that my energy, or at least I should conclude uh, that the, the energy is cascading in a direct sense from the large scale to the small scales. Um, if the opposite is true, if I get a positive sign here, then I, I, am, I am hinted to the fact that I have a, an inverse cascade, uh, much more reminding of two-dimensional things. Um, what I see is that, in fact, this, uh, this um, uh, relationship from running a Yaglam for 3D compressible turbulence holds fairly well. 
um, I normalize it here by minus two epsilon. So if it was dead on to one, uh, this would be perfectly verified. I would say this is very hard to find a perfectly verified experiment, even in uh, classic three-dimensional turbulence. In this free surface flow, we see that there is probably a prefactor to be adjusted there of order one anyway, but definitely the sign is, is correct. We could see this as also a Pandora sector function, but I think in terms of a Lagrangian trajectory, this to me is fairly convincing that the cascade uh, of the energy on the free surface is in fact uh, direct. So it's going down to the small scales, just like in three dimensional incompressible turbulence. Now, the reason why I, uh, I, this is happening, so the reason why the, uh, the cascade is direct as opposed to be uh, you know, uh, inverse. Uh, it is because, I, again, my, my belief, we are we're working on this to, to clarify the, the mechanism, but uh, is that the free surface does not prevent vortex stretching and does not prevent self strain self amplification. Um, what it does uh, prevent is vortex tilting. But uh, our present understanding is that vortex stretching and the strain and self amplification are the main drivers of the dark energy cascade. So the fact that my free surface is uh, causing a reorientation of electricity uh, because of the zero shear condition uh, to be perpendicular to the free surface, um, again, does not kill the, 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 the direct uh, cascade. It might, in fact, in, um, hinder it to a point, but definitely it does not change the direction of the, of the energy cascade. All right. Uh, one thing more that uh, it would be interesting now is to look at uh, per dispersion. We have access to um, extensive uh, trajectories, uh, very long trajectories, um, and the, the, it is very crucial for us to understand that the dispersion of, of particles on the, on the free surface exactly because of the, our motivation from uh, plastic particles uh, floating in the ocean. So we look at classic, uh, so-called Richardson dispersion or, or two-particle dispersion. So we take particles at the separation r, subtract the initial separation r zero, and get uh, the uh, square them, average them, and plot them as a function of time. So as you can see, our, our data indicates uh, a, 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 a ballistic regime. Uh, we don't see a transition to, to a, a Richardson dispersion, which would be with a cube of time. Uh, but in fact, that, that, that would probably be uh, very hard to obtain even for our trajectories because, well, Maybe I'm not going to get into that, but I would say that the Richardson regime is extension is uh, very elusive. But what is interesting, interesting is that the bachelor dispersion or the bachelor regime uh, is is clearly identified. Um, just as a reminder, the bachelor scaling for the uh, per dispersion uh, predicts not only the, 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 the more or less obvious ballistic uh, separation, but it predicts a, a clear prefactor there, which is based uh, essentially on the model of scaling. Uh, based on the fact that the, the structure function would scale as, as uh, epsilon r to the two third, four times smaller than the bachelor time scale, which is uh, the editor the, the over time at uh, the scale uh, r zero, according to the model of scaling. And if I use bachelor scaling, uh, I can actually uh, collapse my data uh, pretty well, uh, indicating that uh, the, the scaling proposed by, by Bachelor for per dispersion, which is nothing else than recasting the uh, Kolmogorov 1941 theory, uh, does work, uh, the work really well. So this, this collapse of the data is, is the first indication that even in a, in a per dispersion sense, the Kolmogorov scaling is, is, is working. Um, something that uh, I find even more interesting in terms of looking at per dispersion is the distance neighbor function. Uh, basically, the, if you want, you can think about it as a PDF of uh, particle separations. Uh, here I'm plotting it and I'm calling it Q. I guess that's a classic notation. Um, Q of R, R being the, the separation here normalized by uh, what I estimated in Michael Mogorov scale, um, plotted for, uh, for multiple times. So as times evolve, um, you see that the, 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 this, this separation PDF spreads around, of course, because particles are spreading, are, are being dispersed by turbulence and diffused by turbulence. And so the PDF uh, of the separations uh, expands. Now, uh, Richardson uh, per separation theory, um, uh, essentially can be, can be written, and Richardson himself in 1927, 26, uh, wrote it as a, a transport equation for such uh, PDF, uh, for such distribution Q. Um, 
in the form that you see that you see over there, and that is basically a diffusive equation, uh, a, a diffusion equation in spherical coordinates. Because remember, Richardson was, of course, looking at three-dimensional domain. Now, I can write the very same type of equation in uh, two-d polar coordinates because that's the space I'm living in. I'm confining myself to a two-dimensional space, so I can just expand this, uh, or I can sorry write this in, in three polar coordinates. Um, and uh, at this point, I can do the same uh, assumption, or I can follow the same proposition that Richardson proposed. He uh, assumed uh, k. In fact, he proposed uh, k uh, proportional to the uh, separation to the four third, um, based on essentially empirical data. Um, it was there was famously some some mistake or some some uh, some misstep in that derivation, but it was a serendipitous uh, misstep, I guess, because this scaling is in fact consistent with Kolmogorov scaling. Um, as it was shown later by Oppenhoff and Bachelor, uh, the, if one takes Kolmogorov scaling to be right, so the dissipation is the only important parameter in the inertia range, then the, 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 the diffusivity cap K can only scale as uh, basically the separation from the fourth. And so following the same ansatz, uh, if I integrate my to the diffusion equation, I get um, this, this type of formula here, um, which is just uh, uh, re applying the very same steps that uh, Richardson applied. And if I do that, I can see that I can collapse all my data uh, uh, very well uh, onto, onto the curve that, that comes from essentially the, the assumption of K, uh, the dissipation being, excuse me, the, the diffusivity scaling with Porter. So as a further last hint here that uh, chromograph theory for three-dimensional incompressible turbulence is really working here. Uh, I have Gaussian velocity equations, I have intermittent accelerations, my dissipation scaling, uh, the my structure functions, uh, the fact that there is a direct cascade, the fact that the, the theory of Bachelor and Richardson work well um, for per dispersion, everything looks points in the same direction. That the free surface turbulence behaves like incompressible three dimensional turbulence. Great, um, except this is impossible. Impossible, or let me rephrase that this is uh, clearly not right 100% because the free surface is not uh, incompressible. Uh, it's not divergence free, and it's a surface. It's not three dimensional. So me uh, take uh, or, or taking the three dimensional incompressible turbulence uh, uh, hallmarks and just uh, seeing them showing up in a two dimensional uh, um, uh, compressible uh, velocity field, uh, something is missing there. What is missing is of course the fact that the the, the velocity field on the free surface is not divergence free. It's not divergence free because well, that's a material surface bounding a, a three dimensional flow. So every time I have an upwelling uh, uh, from uh, underneath, I will have a positive divergence of the free surface. Every time I have a downwelling uh, from underneath, that will correspond to a, a, a convergence, so a, a positive, uh, sorry, negative divergence, so a, a, a sink in the, in, the, in the free surface. Uh, this, of course, leads to clustering. It means that if I look at my tracers uh, floating on the free surface, um, they will not uh, remain randomly distributed, even if I uh, initially uh, disperse them randomly. Uh, they will be attracted by uh, um, the sinks in the velocity field that would be repelled by the sources in the two-dimensional velocity fields. And to quantify this, uh, I can just use the tools from a Voronoi tessellation. This is a technique introduced, uh, uh, or I guess borrowed from astrophysics uh, into fluid dynamics uh, by uh, Mikhail Bourguin and uh, Roman Monchot now more than 10 years ago. And uh, we use it extensively look for, to look at inertial particles and turbulence. When you have inertial particles in turbulence, they also follow a non-divergence-free velocity field. They also cluster, but for different physical reasons, uh, because uh, not because the fluid uh, velocity is, is uh, divergence-free, excuse me, uh, non-divergence-free, but because they, they don't follow such a fluid velocity, they are their inertial, they break away from the streamlines. Um, on the other hand, the traces that we're looking at, they follow streamlines, they are they're supposed to be tracers, but they move on this free surface, which is uh, non-divergence-free. So now we see cluster, the clustering, and uh, we can uh, quantify that by looking at the Voronoi tessellation. In fact, we basically uh, look at um, small polygons uh, uh, drawn around each, each particle of centroid at any given time. And uh, when these polygons are, are close to each other, so they're very small, uh, that's because the particles are clusters. When these polygons are very large, um, that's because particles are, are very far away from each other. Um, and the, the distribution of them uh, for a cluster flow field is the one that we are showing it in blue, is broader 
than the one you will get if the uh, particles were uh, dispersed uh, in a purely random way in a Poisson process. The fact that this broader indicates that uh, here on the on the left, if you can see my cursor, let me actually switch on my, my pointer. Um, here on the left, you have a very high probability of finding very small Voronoi cell areas. This is what uh, symbol here means. This is the PDF of the Voronoi cell areas uh, divided by its uh, average. Um, and here uh, it means that you have a high probability of finding very small cell areas, so very basically a cluster uh, particles. Here on the right, you have a high probability of finding a, um, a very uh, large cell areas, so you have probability of finding a voids, so this gigantic uh, cell area here. It goes to show that their particles are, are not very uh, densely concentrated in this region. Uh, so clearly, I have a strong clustering. And the question now would be on which scales I have such clustering. If I think of inertial particles in turbulence, they are known to cluster typically on, on scales of the uh, Kolmogorov size, at least if they're, uh, they, they, they're not ballistic, they are simply uh, inertial with Stokes number of order one, let's say. Um, how about these, these tracers that float on the surface turbulence? What I can plot is a radial distribution function, which is a probability of the probability of finding two particles uh, at a certain distance from each other. And uh, it's normalized in a way that if the particles are randomly distributed, uh, this radial distribution function is uh, uniformly equal to one. Instead, uh, we find it to be larger than one, uh, close to zero separation, which means we have clustering. And it decays to one only for separations of order of 10 centimeters. Which means that our clusters have a characteristic time scale of order 10 centimeters. Now, notice that this is the largest uh, scales in, in the flow. We have about the integral time scale of order 10 centimeters. So the particles are clustering over huge sets. If I now look at my uh, time scale, uh, with, excuse me, if I now look at the, the temporal autocorrelation of the area, or not cell areas, and the inverse of which is basically the concentration, I can look at the temporal time scale of uh, the, essentially the concentration signal, which means I can look at how uh, long in time uh, particles remain uh, in a cluster or stay in a void. And I can see that this autocorrelation decays over a time scale, which is about one second, which is again my integral time scale. So my clusters are large and they're long lived. They are as large as they can be and they live as long as they can possibly live given the time scales in the system. Um, so uh, I can also investigate the, the, this free surface divergence, which is a culprit for, for this clustering behavior. Uh, I don't have a, a layer velocity field to differentiate, but I can use uh, ideas from Martin Maxi, but uh, lately, uh, I guess, re-elaborated in, in, by, by people in, uh, in uh, Marseille. Um, this is uh, the idea of taking the particle number density, which is just the inverse of my uh, cell area locally, and uh, writing a, a transport equation for it. So uh, if I look at my uh, distrust equation, I can take a time difference version of it, and I can basically isolate my divergence of the uh, particle velocity field. And this divergence essentially is written as the uh, rate of change of the Voronoi cell areas. If you think about this intuitive, if I look, think about the cell area uh, around my, my individual particle, if it's growing, it means that there is a positive divergence right there. If it's shrinking, it means that there is a negative. And so I can plot this divergence of PDF. And the, the, on the left is uh, just my, my, my entire data set, which shows uh, nicely uh, D here is for divergence. And the, the PDF of it shows me nicely and symmetric. Um, and that's obvious because in the mean, I'm not stretching and I'm not compressing my entire free surface. But locally, I am compressing and stretching. And I can see that if I condition my data on the size uh, of the Voronoi cell areas, uh, I have a quantity bit of symmetry. In particular, my small Voronoi cell areas, so my small scales, they show a tendency towards a positive divergence. So they're skewed largely to the positive side of the divergence, whereas my, my uh, large cell areas are uh, somewhat skewed to the negative divergence. So there is a, a significant asymmetry in terms of which scales uh, uh, give me a positive or negative. Divergence. I'm not going to go more in details here in the interest of time. Uh, I'd rather uh, talk briefly about the, the effect of, of having very many particles here. If I am now moving away from uh, the idea of just having tracers that uh, follow the flow and don't affect each other, and I go into the direction of a very dense soup of, of particles, um, what, I, what I will have is particles that start interacting with each other. Of course, uh, we can do that by essentially uh, um, taking our, our particles 
and uh, put in so many of them that now the surface area uh, that I'm covering is substantial. In this case, you can see that the particle area fraction is about 20%, so it's a substantial amount of the free surface that is covered by this millimeter size particle. Um, and if I want to see how they evolve, I can just lock eyes on a certain region and, uh, and essentially do a, a, Galil a, a velocity subtraction in a Galilean invariant sense. And I can uh, see how my, my cluster evolves here. They define my cluster simply as uh, connected uh, regions of particles touching each other. Now, if you look at this carefully, you can see that there is a drift, a uh, little bit like the continents uh, uh, drifting in, uh, over, over uh, millions of years, right? But it, it looks to me like they do something opposite to, to what we think, which is to, 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 to drift away from each other. It seems to me that they're actually getting closer and closer to each other. Uh, so let's give it to this some quantitative uh, um, uh, meaning. Uh, if I take my average cluster area, um, as a function of time, uh, I can see that this is in fact growing. So my mean area of the clusters, it is growing what it seems to be a linear growth uh, with time um, for our data set. Um, and because the, the total number of particles is changing, we are in a steady state, I should expect that these, these clusters are just merging and becoming larger and larger, but also fewer and fewer. And that's of course what I see is uh, in a population balance sense is obvious, the number of clusters is shrinking linearly. So there is an obvious asymmetry here between the uh, um, formation and the breakup of these clusters, um, which I can, I can uh, abuse to uh, capillary interaction. Essentially, when I bring a free surface uh, of particles that are floating on the free surface close to each other, when they get very close to each other, a capillary bridge will form and will uh, provide a force that keeps the particle together. Um, now, that force will prevent at least some of the particles first from breaking up when the, there is uh, intensity for them to break up. When I have a sink in the flow, this when the, the divergence is negative and the particle gets close to each other, when I have a source, the, the tendency of the particles will be to migrate away from each other, but the capillary bridge keeps them together. So this provides a breakup for, for, of this uh, uh, symmetry between aggregation and, and disaggregation. And it does provide a, was a significant mechanism for the formation and the, and in fact, the growth of these big aggregates that we see on the free surface of Kublai. Now, uh, I'll take just uh, maybe a couple of minutes to to mention uh, the results we are we have obtained in the in the stream uh, facility in Minnesota. It's a beautiful facility just close to the Mississippi River. The water you see here uh, spooming uh, up is actually Mississippi River. River, whereas this is an artificial small creek. Um, it's covered by, by, by man, by engineers, but everything else here is natural. The, the vegetation and the type of rocks, but you can, with a weir, you can set the chlorine you want. So it's a very nice facility to uh, carry out laboratory, I would say field scale measurements, because you can see the scales are relatively large, we're talking about uh, almost two meters of width of this creek. Um, but uh, with careful imaging, we have a tent we can put on top of the facility and we can uh, zoom in with this uh, little uh, SP camera and look at how particles move around, uh, floating particles move around. Here we look at uh, small candy-like particles. So this would be uh, what we can consider tracers or almost tracers. Larger particles, in this case, disks, and then long particles, which would be these this toothpicks. And I'm not going to talk about the shape, but I will just confine my attention on the size. This also is a small root number, so the free surface is almost flat. Of course, in this case, it's a natural river, so that the level of flatness is a bit less. You can see that we can attract a Lagrangian trajectory, it's very much like we would do in the lab. And we can even bin this to show that in, in a portion of the, of the small river we were looking at, the flow was actually from genius, both in terms of the mean flow and in terms of the uh, RNS fluctuation. Uh, so we can actually analyze this very much like we analyze the laboratory flow. So I'm not gonna, uh, you know, go over uh, the details. I'm just gonna uh, assume that this is the same thing I'm, I, I showed you for uh, the, the open channel flow. And again, we see the the uh, Gaussian uh, shape of the loss of equations and the uh, intermittent shape of the uh, PDF of the accelerations. Except uh, this is true for the tracers for the small particles. But when I get to large particles, these disks and these rods, you see that uh, for larger, larger particles. The, the, the intermittency in this acceleration is quenched, is reduced, um, which is already a hint that these large particles are behaving just like large particles in turbulence would, meaning they filter out the intense velocity fluctuations or the intermittent velocity. 
which is which is what we normally call the inertial filtering. Um, now, this inertial filtering doesn't only act uh, for the accelerations. It also is, is uh, known to affect how long uh, the particles can follow Lagrangeus. In fact, if I now look at my uh, Lagrangian velocity of the correlation, I see that it decays uh, over longer time scales for my for my disks and my rods. Because of inertial filtering, the motion of the larger particles, it's more time correlated with itself. And uh, this means that by Taylor diffusivity, I'm also expecting a larger diffusivity, because this will be just a product of the velocity variance times the integral time scale over, over my uh, Lagrangian operator. And so this is growing sensibly uh, for, for my larger particles. Um, and this is confirmable if I just look at mean square displacement, which is another way of looking how fast the particles spread from each other. I can see that the larger particles spread measurably faster uh, away from, from, each other, from uh, their original location, let's say, in a mean square displacement. Now, this was very interesting to us, but I guess uh, it's a river flow facility, so it's a, a facility where a lot of things are happening besides the, 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 the nice and simplified turbulent dynamics we want to investigate. So we, we then, in ETH, we wanted to carry out experiments which would capture the same dynamics, but in a laboratory setting, which is well controlled. Um, so one of my grad students is now carrying out experiments uh, on the free surface channel flow, uh, grid turbulence experiment, let's say, uh, but with floating particles of many sizes, spheres and disks, uh, which go from the one millimeter to two to, to ten, and uh, and, and then to yes, later we're doing again fifteen millimeters. So overall, we are seeing a, a behavior which is similar to what we expect for inertial particles in turbulence, let's say finite size particles in turbulence, which means that the uh, uh, particle velocity variance is is being reduced because of the size. This is uh, me compiling data from, uh, from various papers plus our data here in blue. And there is a reduction of particle velocity variance. But this is a small reduction. You can see that the, 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 the fraction of, uh, of, of the velocity variance that we are uh, killing because of the size of the particles compared to tracers, this would be as a function of the particle size with respect to chromograph. It is not very large. We're basically losing uh, maybe 10% uh, or less of the velocity fluctuation because of, uh, of this, the finite size of the particles. On the other hand, the particle correlation time scale is increasing dramatically. Um, here I'm plotting for both uh, disks uh, and, uh, and spheres, so this is uh, classified by x ratio, but I guess in general, what's interesting is that the integral time scale normalized by the integral time scale of the tracers, it is increasing uh, pretty massively with the particle size. Uh, so for particles which are about a third of my M internal time scale, which would correspond to, I guess, some uh, 20 chromograph or 30 chromograph time scale, uh, excuse me, length scales. I have an increase of my integral uh, time scale, so my uh, particle correlation time scale, which is uh, 60, 70 percent. Which means that if I now make the product of these two quantities, the, the particle velocity variance and the uh, correlation time scale, I get my diffusivity. And this diffusivity is increasing with the particle size quite a bit. So this gives us the, the pretty interesting, uh, for practical purposes, a result that floating uh, particles uh, with a finite size should be diffusing faster and faster as they become bigger and bigger, which in fact is, is fairly counterintuitive if you don't really think hard about uh, how Taylor diffusion works and how inertial filtering works. All right, so now let me conclude. I really reached my, oof, overcome my, my 15 minutes time. Um, what I'm concluding here is that um, we see that free surface turbulence uh, shows essentially all the hallmarks of three-dimensional incompressible turbulence, um, except it is not three-dimensional and is not incompressible. The velocity field is compressible and, uh, and is a two-dimensional velocity field. And because it's compressible, it, it induces, as we should expect, clustering of the tracers. What is, was not expected for us is that this, this clustering actually happens over the integral scales of the flow, both in space and time. Um, also, we see, we see that because the particles are floating, and so they, 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 if they interact with each other, uh, they, they do so through uh, capillarity, uh, that provides a mechanism for the clusters to, to grow faster than they are broken down. So eventually, statistically speaking, we are not even at a steady state. We just have a continuous merging of clusters to the point that I could expect the whole my system to become a one large island, a bit like the great Pacific garbage patch. And finally, we are seeing that uh, because of inertial filtering, uh, large particles still floating, but uh, inertial because uh, they're finite size, 
they actually disperse faster than the small, the small particles, essentially because they are, they are more time correlated in their motion. Um, of course, uh, the waves that we are neglecting here uh, are important, eventually would be important for, uh, for many natural flows. So we have started to look into that uh, with a facility that we built uh, last year and inaugurated almost a few months ago. It's a wind wave tunnel, uh, basically a large uh, or I guess a normal size water tunnel. So a few meters in length is eight meter long test section. So 50 meter long facility overall. But the special thing is that there is a wind tunnel on top of it which provides wind uh, that can uh, generate essentially uh, wind-driven waves. Plus we have an active grid in the, uh, uh, in the water, so we can actually tune the, the, the level of turbulence in the water and we can tune the, the, the wind-driven forcing uh, uh, on the free surface. And the idea is really to, to uh, combine the, 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 the wind-driven uh, waves and the bulk uh, uh, turbulence to see how these two effects compete to determine the, the, the pre surface transport, and even they, 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 they cross up with each other, whether the energy is transferred from the waves to, to the turbulence or vice versa, and to which extent. And uh, I guess uh, this facility can run up to very uh, large wind speeds, uh, I guess larger than our present interest, but definitely in the future, it, it can let us investigate even, uh, uh, even uh, violent uh, spray generations and bubble effects. With that, I'll conclude. Thank you very much for your attention. And yes, please use less plastics. Uh, the trend isn't looking good uh, for uh, any one of us. And I believe that you in Australia might be even more sensitive than here, me in Switzerland, about the state of the ocean. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Olivo. Uh, excellent talk and some fantastic experimental facilities there, and also the experiments. Uh, very, very, very interesting. Uh, all right. Uh, yeah, a lot of applause is from the audience. So that's great. Uh, I'll open it up for questions. Uh, anyone has any burning questions, please go ahead and mute and ask it or type it in the chat and we'll read it out for you. Yeah, Puri, go ahead. Um, thanks, Filippo. That was an excellent presentation. Although I'm not in this field, I think I learned a lot from your presentation. Um, so just a question. So it's coming from a grad student. So don't take it harsh on me. Um, I'm asking you for a question. So if I have, so actually two questions. If I have a bunch of particles going, so from your results, you're saying that you couldn't make a distinction by looking at the mean velocity and their fluctuations. What you could find was that from the acceleration component, is that correct? Just confirming this. You looked at the PDF of the acceleration. Is that for, for from your yes, so, yeah. So we looked at the at the PDF of the velocity fluctuations and the accelerations of the free surface flow fluctuations. So, so the impact of shape and size, we couldn't. Oh, okay. We couldn't yes, look at I could, it. I couldn't really see. Yes, sorry, that's correct. I could I could see only very weak. Uh, in the case of the river flow, I could see basically no impact uh, of the shape uh, and size on the on the velocity fluctuations. I could see it on the accelerations. When we then redid it in the in the in the uh, laboratory facility, which is much better controlled and we had higher accuracy, we could see a decrease of the RMS fluctuations. But the moderate one, which is in line with, the, with what people are, are seeing also from the simulations, um, whereas we could see a, a much more significant reduction of accelerations and even more significant reduction, excuse me, extension of the correlation times. Um, and that brings me to the second question. Um, it's I think it just can't stop thinking that the, the rotational motions would be interesting to see if they fo follow the same trend as the acceleration. Did you, did you check right. that? Just a question. Yes. So for, for the disks, no, because that would uh, require me to put markers on the disks, which I haven't uh, done yet, although that would be interesting for sure, and doable. Um, for the rods, we, we have the data and we have we've been analyzing it. Um, I won't pull out extra slides in the interest of time, but I guess that the gist of it is that um, we are seeing uh, our uh, rods essentially uh, rotating, uh, of course, as you could expect, and, and uh, the larger they are, uh, uh, in a sense, the, the slower they rotate, which you, which you would expect from, from filtering effects. Um, the, the interesting part that we are seeing is that they do tend to align themselves with the mean flow, which to me is surprising because they, they aren't slipping away from the fluid very much. Um, but we have to investigate that better. That will require us to essentially have tracers and rods simultaneously in the field of view if you really want to measure the dynamic. 
because on first principles, uh, if the sleeve velocity is as small as they expect it to be, I wouldn't expect uh, them to feel the, the, the direction of motion in a, in a greater than experiment. Uh, but again, we need to investigate that better. No, thank you. I just wanted to see if you saw some similar uh, trend as the acceleration, because you saw that intermittency in the PDF. I oh, just I see, I see. Yeah, I just I see. That... Well, uh, right, right, right. Um, I guess we haven't investigated the rod sizes uh, enough for, to, for me to show a scaling. Yeah. We have done just two rod sizes. Um, I do. I expect to see that the, the larger the rod, the slower it will rotate. And I see through two data points. But for me to see, to see whether that has a follows, let's say, Kolmogorov scaling of the rotational rates, which uh, people will see in three-dimensional turbulence, uh, then I, I really need to have uh, many more data. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sure. Yep. I've got a very quick question. Oh, go ahead, John. This is not yeah. my field, so and it's an excellent talk. But have you are you aware of the work by Haller? He used to work in George Haller. George Haller. And he used to think that in the ocean, there is black holes, and that's where all the stuff I, 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 It's not my field, let's put it this way, but when I read the paper, it was quite interesting. So I'm not sure whether you want to go back and look at the paper. Thank you very much. That's absolutely. Uh, George Haller is, happens to be a colleague of mine here at the PhD. He's, he's, he's a very, very good. There he goes, a very good friend of mine, in fact. Uh, we've been talking about about this. We've been talking about uh, looking at the data through the lens of the, I guess, uh, you know, Lagrangian framework that he really pioneered. Um, and uh, yes, uh, I have a I'm lot of enthusiasm to go in that direction. I feel like I'm still uh, feeling my my way around. I wanted to have a very initial description because honestly, there wasn't any. I, I well, okay. there were some, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, a bit scattered papers. Uh, something that uh, didn't give me a, a frame of reference uh, as I would find in, in other fields. So I wanted to start from there. Um, I honestly think that the, the, the fact that the flow field is compressible provides uh, huge, usually huge opportunities for, uh, for example, identifying the, uh, the attractors and the repelling structures that the George really, uh, really uh, first uh, defined. Uh, even more so than a two-dimensional compressible flow, which is where we are typically used to see. Thanks. Uh, uh, Philip, I had one, uh, just wondering, uh, when you have a mixture of different size of particles, how would that affect clustering? Because I think the, the results, I believe, were just for one particular size, right? Yeah, so that's a, that's a very good question. Um, short answer is, is I don't know, but I have a, a guess. So um, the the, the model is, so clearly the, the the capillary bridge which we are postulating are there, but of course they're difficult to uh, quantify in a turbulence uh, experiment, right? It's not a petri dish; this is large scale flow. But anyway, the capillary bridges, so the, the the capillary interactions will scale with the, with the particle radius, with the length scale of the, of the particle which is floating. And in fact, they will depend very much if, if the particle is hydrophobic uh, or hydrophilic. Imagine that uh, we're looking at all, I don't know, hydrophobic particles um, mm -hmm. or all hydrophilic particles. So they, 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 that effect is not uh, in question, but you have a particle of a different size from another one, uh, then, uh, you know, that force will, uh, will, will be different on the two different particles. You might expect a segregation. You might expect uh, particles which are the same size. Uh, they, uh, or I guess, the smaller particles have a tendency to attract each other more strongly. So, yeah. And the large particles, of course, the the, the, the capillary interaction will be will be less strong. But to define that is not easy because now the particle is floating, right? Uh, uh, so the the and how much it is floating it will define the and, you know whether it's hydrophilic or hydrophobic will define the exact shape of of that uh, of the capillary bridge. So I do think it might become complex and not only a function of the size, but also of the geometry of the part. Um, I, I do expect some segregation. I do expect the small particles uh, to attract more to each other. So probably producing clusters of very small particles altogether, but that remains to be, to be verified. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, if not, then please join me in thanking uh, Philippa for an excellent talk. 
Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Philippo. That was this was really amazing. Thanks.